It is uh, Dr. Thomas Dobbs. Good morning, sir. How are you? Uh, good morning. Thank you all for having me. Uh, it is a pleasure. i got to ask you about this, first of all, because it was this story that our news department has that you have or the state has requested the uh, hospital ship, the Norfolk Base uh, Comfort. Can you give us some details of that? Yeah, you know, we're committed, um, you know, and, and certainly the governor has been instrumental in all of this. Um, we and MEMA and the governor's office to bring whatever resources we can to make sure that uh, we can bring as many Mississippians out of this. As you know, the hospitals are absolutely overwhelmed. Um, we have essentially zero ICU capacity and we have overflowing patients in the ER who are waiting to get in, into beds, ICU beds and floor beds. Mm -hmm. So we, we have multiple asks. We're trying to bring in um, medical teams who can augment our hospitals and, and that's underway. I know you've seen the stuff about UMC open up the, the, the tent hospital. And we also have a request for, we're working on, you know, paid staffing support from contract agencies. And we've, we've, we've yeah. asked about the USS Comfort, if that's a possibility. Is any reply on that, Dr. Dobbs? I mean, have they answered and said, yeah, we'll be able to get it there? And if, if they can get it here, uh, looking at hopefully a peak in the uh, next uh, several weeks, would it be here in time? Um, yeah, you know, what we really need is the staff, to be honest. We need mm -hmm. we need the people that are there. And, um, you know, if we could get those Navy folks to come work for us, that'd be great. If they need to come on yeah. the ship, that'd be great. Of course, you know, we have the hurricane season coming up. So that, that does put some, some uh, you know, a little bit of the bee in the bonnet sort of situation. True. So it's, it, that, yeah. that may not really be a practical approach. Let me, well, well, how many beds are we talking about as far as the additional hospital been set up at UMMC? Well, the, the UMC location should have about 50 more beds. Um, we're looking mm -hmm. at putting up additional units. We're going to try to have capacity north, south, and central to, to augment what's going on. That will not be enough. Um, we're looking at everything we can do. We knew this was um, going to come, and it's actually uh, worse than we had anticipated. When, when you start talking about this, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, you, so I think we had 3,163 in the last report. Of those, um, how many are requiring, and I mentioned earlier, we have some people who want to negate the seriousness of this. Always go to uh, those 3,163 on uh, yesterday's report to say, well, you know, I had a few sniffles, but I'm okay. But it goes every, everywhere from, and I, I mentioned earlier, from I mean, slightly menacing symptoms to the morgue. So you can't base it on any, any given uh, particular symptom. But how many of those people actually wind up to the point where they have to, um, they have to go to the hospital? Yeah, so um, about historically, it's ranged between about seven and fifteen percent, and and if we're using that mm -hmm. sort of seven percent number of going to the hospital, so today I'm going to give you some news. Yeah, just we're going to report numbers. over forty four hundred cases today. A new record so by almost a thousand. We are flying up, and out of those forty four hundred, we anticipate at least three hundred nine new hospitalizations, and ninety three deaths. We know that if if people go in the hospital with COVID, the mortality rate of going in the hospital is 15%. This is no small thing. And we've also seen that the mortality group that's growing the rapid most rapidly and is accounting for most of the deaths is, is, is moving into the 50 to 64 year old. But we've had a dozen people die in the last couple of days under, um, under 50. We had three healthy people in their 20s die this week and two of them were pregnant. I mean, this is this is a menacing thing. Uh, the the Delta variant is deadly, and we just got to do what we can to prevent it. Are the symptoms basically the same? You know, they are the same. It, it seems a little bit different. We're trying to categorize it, but of the cases that I've seen and tested myself, they have the loss of taste, loss of smell. Sometimes mm -hmm. people think they have just a little sinus infection sort of thing, but by and large, they're the same. And, and the same thing with the serious outcomes. Um, it, it's you know the same sort of you know you know viral pneumonia and sepsis. Have the um, what percentage of these the, the folks who are going in? You said forty four hundred new cases will be reported today when the press release goes out. Uh, of those people who are getting COVID uh, through the test, what does the record show that they've been unvaccinated? What what's the percentage now? So of our new cases, ninety seven percent are unvaccinated. 
So just wow. know that this, this, this thing is being driven by folks who are not immune. 97% unvaccinated. And some of those are reinfections, people who've had it before. Um, previous infection is not a surefire way to keep from getting it again. The, um, but uh, if we look at our deaths, it's 90% of our, I mean, 90% uh, of our hospitalizations are unvaccinated. And uh, uh, like uh, 80, I think 85% of our deaths are, are unvaccinated. The reason for that is, is we're seeing spillover toward vaccinated older folks and people with weak immune systems of our yeah. vaccinated deaths. The, the median age is 78 and over half have severe underlying uh, immune uh, weaknesses. What is the, the, we don't talk enough about this monoclonal uh, antibody treatment. Is it a, what's the, is it a resinol? What's the, the other name for that? Is, there's another name, isn't it? Yeah, yes, sir. It's the Regeneron product that we're using mostly now, a Regen CoV. It's the same thing that uh, President Trump received when he got sick. Um, oh, yeah. it, it works yeah. be beautifully. It works great. Um, it's available either as an infusion, like a drip, or as a subcutaneous injection, like you just get up under your skin. We have a network of 41 hospitals that offer this product through our Center of Excellence program. If you get COVID, please talk to your doctor. This is one of the things we're trying to expand. We have requested 10 federal teams to set up special clinics for um, giving antibodies. So talk to your doctor about getting this. We're going to do everything we can to pull out the stops because it reduces hospitalization by 80 to 90 percent, and it will save lives. Is this uh, an overnight procedure, or is it just an in-office visit? Or what? Describe it a little bit. Yeah, it, it's an office visit. Um, it can be done as an outpatient in the ER. And if mm -hmm. it's the infusion, it takes about an hour to get the drip. And then you, they watch you for an hour just to make sure everything's okay. And if you get the injection, the injection's almost like instantaneous, right? It's just done. And then they watch you for an hour, and you go home. So it reduces hospitalization, according to this, 80 to 90% cuts mortality rate? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and is you can imagine, paid, it, I mean, yeah. is that paid for by insurance? Is it covered by the insurance? It, it is, as a matter of fact. So the product itself, Regeneron, is a, is provided free of charge by the government, but um, insurance does pay the infusion fee, um, mm -hmm. which is substantial. So it's a it's a it's a good uh, you know margin of payment for the for the hospital so that they can try to um, you know ramp up those services. I've heard some numbers, and uh, these have been bounced around. We did a story, I think it was the first part of this week, on the efficacy of uh, now about six months into it. What's, what's your stats show at the State Health Department as far as where we are now in the antibodies from different ones? Let's take, first of all, Pfizer. Because mm -hmm. yeah, I've heard know, anywhere was... from 86% to 31%. Yeah, no, that, that's really interesting, um, and we need to dig in and look at that. Looking at our own data, we're seeing a lot of benefit from Pfizer still. Um, almost all of our nursing home folks got Pfizer because that was the first one available, and we were trying to, you know, prioritize them. And we've seen a stunning decline in nursing home cases. We have, like, over every day of over 150 long-term care outbreaks, but almost all the cases are in unvaccinated employees, and we only have a handful of deaths in nursing homes. We have seen a dramatic decline in our 65 and older mortality rate, and that's entirely due to the vaccination. Um, and they mostly mostly got Pfizer. So I, I'm curious a little bit about some of those studies. The New England Journal showed 88 percent effectiveness for, for um, with support for Pfizer. So we'll see. But our data shows that we're still getting phenomenal effect from from Pfizer and Moderna. I guess the only thing is that you'd have to bring in some people now in the next few days and just take a look if you want a current and topical to, to take an antibody test to find out exactly if you have a Pfizer compared to Moderna. Is Moderna, um, is that Moderna, is that basically the same thing? I, I heard it was a little bit higher. Yeah, so there there is, you know, Mayo did this study that looked at, that looked like the Moderna was a little bit better against the Delta variant. It's not your level of antibodies, I think they're speculating, but the type of antibodies you, you generate. So I think that, you know, kind of stay tuned. I think we're going to learn a lot more of that in coming days. How about uh, Pfizer? Uh, not Pfizer, but did some Johnson & Johnson surprise you a little bit on that study? Not really. I mean, we've, we've always known it wasn't quite as strong, but it's one shot and some people really like that. Here's the other thing I want to ask you when we come back. Let's take a look, at, and there are a lot of parents out there worried now about the kids because it seems that the Delta variant has become a little bit more uh, uh, threatening to uh, the younger generation. We can talk about that when we come back. you have enough uh, time for another segment, sir? Yes, sir, absolutely. We got it. Back in just a moment with more with uh, Dr. Thomas Dobbs. How 
vulnerable are your kids to the unvaccinated? That is, officer. And I, I, I do want to go back to this because you, you kind of teased me a little bit on the uh, on the last segment. You said stay tuned because we're going to have some more figures. Is there a new study as far as the efficacy of, of all of those now, this six or seven months in? Is that something that is uh, just normally coming or you've been alerted that that might happen? Well, you know, we're digging into our own data, kind of looking at the efficacy. And we haven't seen the same sort of decline. But I think as we're seeing the Delta variant kind of roll through, a lot of states and CDC are definitely going to have data to help support this because the whole the whole the, the real big question out there right now is the booster question, right? I mean, where are we going with boosters? Right. I think that's yeah. going to inform where we go with that. Uh, since you brought that up, let's go on and talk about it because we got a blind forming here with the Dr. Wright and uh, Pete a few moments ago. So everybody wants the booster. Hey, uh, don't forget. Well, and and Perez, we got a line of fours <laughs> forming. But I mean, is what's the tenure? What what do you think the schedule is going to be on that one? And what do we have to do to get it? Because there are a lot of people who had the vaccine, are, are looking at this and and deciding if they if they are available, they're going to be in line. Yeah. So we're still trying to figure that out. A, a couple of weeks ago, um, as you may know, we sent out some general guidance to physicians about boosters, and there is clear evidence that people with weak immune systems, transplant patients. Uh, you know, immunocompromised folks because of, you know, rheumatoid arthritis or um, cancer patients w would potentially benefit. And so it needs to be a one-on-one -on -one conversation. We're kind of caught in a little bit of a um, uh, an unclear situation with, their, with the EUA out there. So, um, but clearly it makes sense to vaccinate those folks. Um, we have a strong feeling about that. Now for everybody else, older folks, maybe um, we're working on data with UMC to see that what that's like. But for young, healthy folks or young, healthy-ish folks, um, I think that the jury's out. Uh, CDC advisory committee is meeting tomorrow, and I think this is going to be the main topic of discussion. And actually, I have a phone call with Dr. Walensky in about uh, 30 minutes. So I think we're going to talk about that, too. So expect more information to come up in, in, in a little bit. So are you seeing the boosters are available now for those people who are compromised? Well, doctors have been giving them to their patients. And, and Dr. Yeah. Byers informed okay. me yesterday we've given 8,500 booster doses in the state of Mississippi. Is it the same shot, Dr. Dobbs? I mean, it's just another shot. Uh, would, and would you recommend, well, let's say if you've had uh, Johnson & Johnson, probably you folks want to look at it first? Yeah, so we, you know, it's the same exact vaccine, just an additional dose, you know, for people who are, okay. you know, who are right. vulnerable. Now, for the Johnson & Johnson, though, there is data that you can extrapolate from England where they gave the um, AstraZeneca and then followed it with a Pfizer, and that seemed to be better. So, um, you know, docs can use that information to make a decision. A lot of questions coming in on the ceasefire text line. But do if you've taken Pfizer, does your booster have to be Pfizer or could it be whatever's available? Well, right now, that's been the practice and the the clinical the, the studies that are out there, they use the same vaccine again. And so we're trying to stay within mm -hmm. the confines of what the medical evidence is. And so right now, that would seem to be the recommendation potentially. Give me your uh, analysis of, uh, because we have a changing threat since the Delta variant uh, as far as younger and younger Mississippians. What's your analysis of this? You know, we're looking at this. There's a hint of evidence that it might be more deadly for younger folks. Um, we do have some evidence that we're seeing a slightly higher case fatality rate. Um, but it, it may well be that we're just having so many people get it. Um, maybe we have some underreporting um, because it's, cause Delta is just so contagious that we just have a, just an overwhelming number of young people getting it. I just do want to reiterate that um, young folks who are vaccinated are, are pretty much 100% perfect, you know, protected. If you're under 50 um, and you get the vaccine, we've seen really fabulous near about 100% protection from severe illness and death. Um, if you're, you know, it's really sad. We've seen younger folks. We had a guy died, like oil field worker. He's kind of a tough guy, a little bit overweight. And he was like, you know, I'm tough. I don't need it. And um, he got COVID and he died. It's not about how tough you are. Your body can't control if you die from a virus. I would imagine a lot of these two, and I'm thinking about the younger, uh, the the boomer generation, and certainly the the greater generation. They didn't want to go to the doctor; they absolutely had to. And this is one of those things that the longer you, since it's a respiratory uh, ailment, this is one of those things. If you let it go and you think you can kick it, you're going to be in trouble. Yeah, and and please, I mean, we just want to save lives. And if you're not vaccinated and you think you'll get over it, please talk to your doctor about monoclonals anyway, because those also would have saved a lot of these lives. So 
we have sort of a two-stop process. I mean, the vaccine is the best thing to do, but if you get out of the gate and you get COVID, please talk to your doctor about monoclonals. One more question here. Do you, uh, somebody asked, do you um, recommend the visor mask? I never thought about that. Is the visor mask. We have some doctors who wear that. Yeah. So the, the data for those is is somewhat variable. Um, it doesn't know that it helps that much. I mean, I know the mask thing gets pretty contentious with folks, but there's clear data that it does prevent transmission. Um, the visor, maybe. There's just not as strong a data. But if you do both, great. You know, we do know that eyes are a potential way of transmission. Yeah. But um, as a replacement, it doesn't seem to have a lot of strong evidence. Well, with all of this and with everybody just begging people to get uh, vaccinated, can you give us any information at all across the state? Are vaccinations picking up? Are people listening to this? Yeah, you know, some folks are. We have seen a tripling in our vaccination rate in the past month. So we gave over 60,000 last week. We'd love to give 200,000. Um, you know, really, we, we've been saying it for a while, and I think it's, it's really true. At some point, you're either going to have to get the vaccine or COVID. And, and COVID is deadly. It's killed over 7,500 Mississippians. And we haven't confirmed a single death from the vaccine. Um, the, some of these kind of sort of like Internet hoaxes are totally undermining reality. And, and they do not cause infertility. As a matter of fact, COVID itself is very well known to harm reproductive health. This is just more Internet hoax yeah. stuff. We're, we're letting. I'm, I, I haven't seen that yet. It causes infertility. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that was. Um, yeah, that's something without that. Yes, sir. Um, do you also recommend getting the flu shot? Because it's that time of the year, isn't it? Yeah, no, absolutely. We do recommend getting the flu shot. Um, we, we still, you know, especially for vulnerable people, we'll have a lot of people who get sick and die from the flu. Um, but also, you know, we, we will often have younger folks who, who, who have the flu and, yeah. and will do very poorly what with you, it. So absolutely. What, what do you think the what do you think the misdiagnosing rate is between uh, a a doctor misdiagnosing between the flu and, and COVID. Is there? Yeah, th that's the key. You can't tell the difference just by symptoms. And that's why you really got to test folks. And so um, if you have flu symptoms, you may have COVID. If you have COVID symptoms, you may have flu, except for the taste thing. The taste and the smell being lost is, is pretty much specific to COVID. So if you have that, it's almost certain you have COVID. Any final thoughts, sir? I know we want to get everybody vaccinated that could possibly be vaccinated. We have some hot spots across the state, uh, as as we heard earlier. I think we Neshoba County, probably from the fair, of course. But uh, we have a lot of other things going on, and people are just gathering and trying to shake loose. But uh, it was a little bit disturbing this morning. I saw several news stories about restaurants now beginning to think, okay, we can't keep it open. we got to shut it down. And that's a little scary. Yeah, I think the Neshoba thing is, is very telling. Um, we, we knew that there would be cases, but, and, and there's been, there have been a lot, right? This Delta wave isn't going to last forever. And, you know, if you can just put off an indoor social gathering for, for a few weeks, maybe a couple of months, yep. it's not worth risking your life or the life of your family. So just, you know, lay low if you can avoid indoor social gatherings. That's where we're seeing a lot of transmission like weddings. And, and as you can imagine, a funeral is pretty high risk because, you know, yep. just, just envision the visitation line. I mean, that's a sad way to spread COVID. Do you see a peak anywhere else in the, as far as uh, any other state where it's beginning to peak or it looks like it may be? You know, we're still we're still going up pretty quickly. I know some of the other states um, that are less affected by us are seeing increases, Oregon and places. But the magnitude of what they're seeing is far less than what we're seeing. You know, mm -hmm. for us to have a Delta surge was inevitable. But for us to have this level of death and um, morbidity was avoidable. Um, you know, we're going to have a lot of people who die needlessly. We're going to have a lot of people on disability. That's going to be the next thing. I mean, that, that's going to undermine our economy, having people who are not fully employed and are going to be collecting disability checks. That's on the way. Well, the other thing uh, that I gather from this, too, and I, I, I garner from, from or to gather from our, our conversation, is when you start talking about the people who've gotten Delta variant, uh, sometimes have already had the COVID-19 so if they don't, there's a possibility if there's another variant that happens and actually does happen, they could get it again and at, at more severity. They're not building up the antibodies is what you're seeing. Yeah, well, and it changes a little bit and you have partial protection. But what we've seen, and, and CDC had some data out this week, that if you've had COVID before and then you get a vaccine, that your antibody and your immune response is like supercharged, it's like the golden ticket. That's the most immune you can be. So it's super important. We still recommend folks, if you've had COVID before, to please get vaccinated also. 
All right. Well, we're going to come stand uh, present. I will be standing outside your office waiting for that booster. So uh, <laughs> when, it's, it, when it's time, I'll do it. I'll do it live if you want to. <laughs> we'll we we will we will be there if you we'll are right here. here. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Uh, stay.